Hi, my name is Christopher Balzano, and welcome to Tripping on Legends, episode 66. Uh, we're trying a few different things here, and so um, I'm going to uh, uh, start out by saying that if you are listening to this on podcast, please come in when you can and get these live feeds. Uh, I'm actually doing, because of being quarantined, because of staying in the house and having to stay in the house, I'm actually doing today's episode directly from the house. I'm not um, uh, not recording it ahead of time. Uh, I'm not allowed to have anyone over to co-host with me, uh, although we do have a special caller hopefully coming in later. Um, so for right now, what we're going to do uh, is just kind of do it this way. So I'm say sharing it on Instagram. Uh, the Instagram is at Spooky Tripping. Uh, I also am on the Facebook page at facebook.com backslash Tripping on Legends. Usually it's shared there. I'm going through my um, personal feed right now. I'm trying to figure out this new live, how to how to save it that way. But for now, it's going to be okay. Um, so I want to get that information out because these live shows really depend on interaction with people, whether it's interaction in the chat room, whether it's interaction calling live. Uh, the number is actually 813-418-6822. And I know we're going to be getting a call uh, in the second half hour of the show, and I'm really kind of excited about that because... Not only is it an amazing guest, but it has allowed me to focus more on some of the folklore uh, about what's going on today, or what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and so she can, I can basically steal her stuff. Uh, she's going to be focusing in on the actual legend that we're talking about because she is an expert in it. Um, she's an authority on it. She's the person who um, kind of framed all the stuff that we're going to talk about tonight. It's, 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 it's funny because, you know, we always talk about Hashtag follow the signs. And this was really one of those uh, moments again this week um, to bring me to ultimately the legend trip that I'm talking about today that hopefully we're going to be able to take once everything has been lifted, which is something called Comfort Station in St. Pete. So if you are listening live or if you're listening on your podcast, unless you're driving, if you don't do this if you're driving, but you can kind of get like, oh my word, what is that? You can start Googling that. You can start trying to check out what that is before we get to that uh, in the second part of the show. But in the first part of the show, I'm going to talk about the path uh, and the folklore that kind of led me to that um, led me to that story. So I've taken notes on it in case she can't. She ends up not showing up. Um, but I'm really hoping she is able to come in and talk about it because as I tell you the story of how I came up with tonight's episode – as all things tend to do whenever you're talking about anything in Pinellas County, whenever you're talking anything in Hernando County, when you're talking about um, Hillsborough County, you're talking about that area, um, all paths lead uh, to Dr. Brandy Stark. So I'm hoping that she's going to be able to come in at about 9.30 or so and share the actual stories and the mythology behind this legend. Um, and until then, I want to tell you uh, the path that I took to get where I am tonight. Right to to figure out um, the way that my mind works. It's a scary thing. Most people don't want to think about how my mind works because it'll bring you strange places. Um, so it was uh, last Saturday, and I am cleaning the house. It's it's a bit later at night. Um, I have to. Uh, schedule when I clean things in my house based on the absolutely erratic functioning of my um, of, of the water system in my house. This actually becomes part of what we're talking about tonight. Um, so I'm doing the dishes and rather than watching something on TV, like sometimes I have my phone up there, I'm watching uh, Gilmore Girls, or I'm watching West Wing, or I'm watching The Office, you know, some traditional thing to kind of uh, occupy my mind while I'm doing that, or I'm listening to the radio. Um, I was listening to a book on tape. And uh, so I, I got this via Audible, I think like three years ago. And the name of the book is uh, Haunted Experiences, okay? Um, Ghosts in Contemporary Folklore. And it's got several different authors, so I won't get into that part. Um, now, this is the second time that I've listened to it on Audible, and I've actually read through the book as well. As you can actually see, I've got only one um, only one sticky note in there right now. But I'm listening to it, uh, and it's kind of the beginning part of the book. It's technically, I guess, the first 
after the introduction, like the first theme or motif of this idea of haunted folklore. And she's talking about bathrooms, right? And she's talking about this idea of bathrooms in our folklore stories, bathrooms in our, and we'll extend it for this, bathrooms in our horror stories are often a central character. And I'll get into why that is and kind of some of the other ideas having to do with that. But this idea that um, hauntings can confine themselves to a single room in your house and that there's a reason for that. And she's talking and I'm kind of like, I know all this stuff, right? I know these stories. I know that I know, and I've, I've, you know, and I've read this part. And then she talks very specifically about the Hanaka. And I'm gonna get into great detail with the Hanaka when we get there. But the Hanaka is essentially this Japanese water ghost, this Japanese toilet ghost, for lack of a better word, uh, that is really, really popular in Japanese culture, especially Japanese culture, like tween girls, um, to the point that it is, there are comic books about it, there's anime or manga, 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 however it's pronounced, my daughter corrects me all the time, and it, it seeps into their horror movies, it seeps into their popular culture, it seeps into their school culture, we'll talk about, and I had never heard of it. I think I even wasn't even really paying attention when I had first read the first time I had read the book and uh, first time I had listened, I was like, mm -hmm, that seems like something interesting. Um, but for some reason, a lot of bells really started going off. And I started thinking of this like, there are, there seems to be a lot of these Japanese stories that have to do um, with the bathroom, right? So hashtag follow the signs. For the last two weeks, I have been obsessed um, with the case of Elisa Lam. If you've never heard of the case of Elisa Lam, if I say the name, you probably be like, I don't even know who that is. But if I describe the incident slightly, you might. So Elisa Lam um, was a Canadian. She was Asian. I'm trying to remember where she was from in Asia. I think she was Korean, um, who was staying at the Cecil Hotel in LA. And she inexplicably, uh, she, she disappeared. She inexplicably was found in the water tower at the top of this hotel. And it's this really interesting mystery as to, was she murdered? Did she commit suicide? Was it, um, you know, was it, uh, was there something paranormal, supernatural going on? Because there is this really creepy video, right? When you're finished listening tonight, Put Elisa Lamb, if you've never seen the video, put Elisa Lamb uh, and search for it. It is one of the creepiest things that I've ever seen. It's disturbingly creepy. And it's this young woman who is, um, she's in an elevator. And she seems to be running from something that is unseen by, by the audience. And she's trying to get way in this elevator and she's trying to she's pushing things away at one point she goes out it looks like she's yelling or talking to something she gets in on the elevator out of the elevator it's really really disturbing and then hours later i shouldn't say hours later she disappears and days later she's found in the um uh, in top of the hotel in a water tower dead um and i'm really just glancing over over this um and so it's really funny the way, you know, hashtag follow signs, the synchronicity of things, because I'm watching or I'm listening to this really great podcast uh, called Tales of Mystery Unex uh, Tales of Mystery Unexplained. So if you've never heard that, you need to check that out because it's, re it's a really great podcast that are these little segments, maybe half hour, unsolved, creepy tales. The first time I listened to it, I listened to it because of the uh, the whole smiley clown cult killings, because uh, she was doing an episode of that. Once you get over the voice, like the initial time you can hear, you're gonna be like, I don't like this person because I don't like the voice. Once you get over that, uh, it actually becomes like you look for the voice, it fits perfectly. But she had done like a two-parter on this, one on, on Elisa Lamb and then one on the Cecil Hotel, because it has all this crazy stuff having to do with it. Uh, several different serial killers made that hotel their home, including uh, the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, uh, Ramirez 
And if you know me at all, you know, Richard Ramirez is like the scariest thing in the world to me. Um, the odd thing is, is this was in, in 2000, in 2000, um, in 2005 and 2004, uh, two, uh, two different movies were made called Dark Water. And if you've ever seen, or Dark Waters, if you've ever seen them, um, they are eh, meta meta. The first one, 2002, is a, um, is a Japanese movie. It's supposed to be like the third movie in the Ring trilogy. I think it's The Ring, The Grudge, and, and Dark Waters. And then we did an American version with Jennifer Connelly. I've seen it. I wasn't overly. It's kind of like all these different tropes of horror movies. But the idea was, oddly enough, the same. I'm not going to spoil it if you haven't seen the movie. Uh, and Lorene, I know that you love a horror movie. If you haven't seen Dark Waters or the original, um, that's something you should watch. But the weird thing about it is it mirrors this whole Elisa Lamb case, um, including, and this was the weird part, including the idea that um, Elisa Lamb's wearing the same clothes as Jennifer Connelly, or one of the characters does, in the movie. Um, and as I'm listening to this um, audiobook talking about the Hakano and briefly describing the Hakano, all of a sudden it was like, well, wait a minute, that's how the Hakano is dressed in the description that this book gives. And so I immediately stopped doing the dishes. That was my excuse for not doing the dishes that night. I immediately stopped doing the dishes uh, and I started reading about it. And as I'm doing that, I'm, I'm living in today's world, right? I'm living in uh, 2020, you know, it's tax day, 2020. And we're coming off of the, I think we're coming off of this wave of obsession with toilet paper. And so many people talking about why, why are we so crazed about toilet paper? Why was the first thing that people rushed out to get um, during this time, toilet paper. That was the first thing off the shelves, even before disinfectant soap and masks and gloves and all that stuff, it was this mad rush for toilet paper. And of course, everyone's got their commentary on why that is. And part of the reason for it um, is this idea of control, right? So if you can imagine that there are um, things in this world that are out of our control, we can't control what happens when we leave our house and we're exposed to other people or whatever. But we can control securing our house. We can control um, the way that we make ourselves clean. Um, and it ties in with this idea that we have an obsession with bathrooms. You know, it's interesting because we really don't push forward the the bathroom ghost which is kind of the topic of tonight's ghost the uh, tonight's episode these this idea that ghosts of the bathroom are not only in ghost stories of the bathroom are not only really creepy they're the ones that oftentimes um are powerful emotional but and here's here's the the thing they're they're oftentimes pushed aside right so we know them they're in the back of our minds they're maybe they're even creepier than the other ones which is why we push it off but but it's also this place that's supposed to be where we take the it's 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 an interesting like um it's an interesting little thing going on right because it's the area where we take the unclean stuff out of us, and yet it is inherently unclean, right? Like no one says, hey, you know what we should do? We should go to the bathroom and eat, right? Like you do a lot of things. You spend a lot of time on your phone in the bathroom. Um, you do a lot of it, but you don't hear of people being like, you know what, I'm gonna go have a pizza in the bathroom. It's this um, place where we clean ourselves, we shower, we wash our hands, we go to the bathroom, we get the unclean stuff that's inside of us that we don't know what it is, right? There's this fascination we have with what we don't know about our own bodies, right? And we know, we know the basics of it. Unless you're really a medical professional, we know it and, and we don't know really the details of it until it becomes a problem. Then all of a sudden we become experts in it. Trust me, if you know me, you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
but this idea that it's a it's this unclean place that we don't talk about right you don't talk about what happens in the bathroom um and it's this idea that is part of the reason why these stories get kind of brushed under the rug maybe a bathroom mat brushed under the bathroom mat um there are other reasons why the bathroom is inherently scary. And, I, and a lot of it has to do, I think, with childhood, right? When we are kids, uh, it's kind of one of the first things we're really forced to do is to learn to go to the bathroom. And it's scary. It's scary. If you can think like, you know, a two-year-old or a one-and-a-half-year-old, however, you know, there are obviously different ages where people learn that stuff or, or are – asked to commit to going to the bathroom. That's a weird way of phrasing it, but you know what I mean. This um, situation where they're being um, forced to do something that they've always thought of as dirty, that someone's always done for them, they've always thought as dirty. Um, but then the idea of, it's really loud, right? It's loud going there. Like if you're a little kid, where does the poop go? Where does the pee go? Like it's 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 both and if you know this if you're like me and you've tried to use the plumbing i i hinted at the beginning of this episode the plumbing in this house i am i am under assault by the plumbing in this house everything from the dishwasher and if you follow the show you know my miss the mystery of the dishwasher to this backing up flooding that's going on to all this litchfield issues that i'm having um it seems to be the way that the house is kind of turning against me here i'm not trying to sign paranoid just kind of giving you context um, but you learn how the bathroom works once again, when things go wrong, if you don't, if it's just kind of a given is, well, where does the, where does the poop go? Like th there's a mystery there and yet it's part of our house. It's, it's, and it's, it's inherent, inherently part of ghost stories because the first explanation for why things are happening in your house is, oh, it's bad plumbing. And we throw that excuse out there because we honestly have no idea how plumbing works the majority of us until something goes wrong. And yet, Don, <clears throat> there's also paranormal reasons why the toilet might be a great place for a ghost. And the number one uh, thing on that list is the fact that it's water, right? And water, you've commented that water is a conduit and running water is said to uh, depending on the folklore and the science that you believe in, it's either um, uh, helps to bring ghosts in, right? Helps to kind of create juice for the spirits, or it even uh, can be has been used or kind of like thrown out there as a uh, um, a stopping thing, right? When we were doing the the uh, manatee, the singing river, the singing manatee river. It, it, the story came from a book called, you know, Ghosts Can't Cross Water. So there's that whole legend of Ghosts Can't Cross Water. Therefore, if someone dies in your house, um, then all of a sudden they're trapped in your house because their spirit can't leave because the plumbing has technically kept them here. And that situates itself, that concentrates itself in your bathroom, right? So all of these things, the the, the mystery of it, the, and of course, we can't overlook the vulnerability of it. You are most vulnerable in your shower. The reason why Psycho is a great movie, do people really remember too many of the other scenes in Psycho or do they remember the shower scene? It is the most vulnerable we can be. I remember uh, the movie came out, I think in 1980, but I think it didn't make it to ABC Sunday night movie until uh, um, 1981, was that whole alligator movie. The idea that there was an alligator that was huge. It was my first exposure to an urban legend the alligator in the sewer, this idea that this something was going to come up from beneath. And like Joss in the, um, I quote Joss in the actual thing. Whoa, something weird is going on here. Oh my word, something's gone wrong here. All right, am I back on? Something very weird just happened there, but that's okay. We're gonna we're gonna survive and, and keep going. Um, the idea that you know the terror comes from from beneath you, and there was something unrealistic, which was this alligator there um, in the sewer. 
but then the idea seemed to like permeate that there were snakes that would come out from the toilet. There was, it just, so it's a natural um, progression to think of that hand coming out of the toilet, right? Um, that moment where you're awake just enough to uh, fear something. You wake up in the middle of the night, you have to go to the bathroom, it's dark, maybe you turn the light on, maybe you don't turn the light on, but that idea that just creeps into your brain a little bit that something's going to reach out from underneath and, and grab you, right? It's really kind of this crazy um, um, fear that we have, which is um, not all that uncommon and not all that crazy, right? And we've already talked about some of the um, reasons why a ghost could potentially be there. And it's funny because as I'm doing that, and any moment now we're going to have our guests come in to talk about a very specific one that we're going to do. Um, but this idea that bathrooms can be haunted. And it was funny because as I'm going through my list, I'm thinking, you know what? I've actually tripped uh, and experienced hauntings at several different bathrooms. Uh, so I'm going to go through that list. Before I get into some of the folklore, I'm going to get into some of the... Um, some of the ghosts that I've encountered in bathrooms. But before I do that, I'm actually going to bring in my guest for tonight. From Brandy Stork. Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you doing tonight? How are you doing? <laughs> okay. After work and, you know, still awake, but it's good. So uh, I was about to get into some of the... Um, to some of the famous bathroom, haunted bathrooms that I've explored over the years. But it's an excellent segue into uh, one that I had heard of and ignored, but now I'm planning to legend trip. And so I thought I would bring in the leading authority on any kind of Pinellas folklore having to do with ghosts whatsoever. Is that a legitimate intro for you? I'm gonna go with that. All right, good, good, good. So. If you don't know, if you don't follow my page, and if you and if you haven't seen some of the uh, stuff I've posted in pretty much every urban legend I've tracked down, uh, we are on the phone with Dr. Brandy Stark. Um, and Dr. Stark, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, um, I founded the Spirit of St. Petersburg in 1997, and I've been doing uh, paranormal investigations primarily in County, but we've, you know, we've come down the West Central Coast area uh, for the past 23 years. Um, I am, uh, I'm still in education, but uh, I, I backed off a little bit. Uh, I was a full-time faculty member, um, and I decided to uh, to embrace my love of the arts. Right at the time, you know, I had six good months, and then we had a pandemic. Right. <laughs> Here we are, but, but um, it, uh, I taught uh, history, uh, classics, religion, humanities, and literature, and I utilized the supernatural as kind of a, a great element, a great way to uh, look at human culture and, and you know, how we deal with the supernatural and the mysterious. So um, it's been quite a bit of fun, but yes, when you, uh, you mentioned the one in Pinellas, I was like, okay, that makes sense. Right. <laughs> the one site, yes. And so if anyone is, has never has never heard the episode, um, we did, oh my word, it's totally escaping, oh, Safety Harbor. Uh, we did a kind of a yeah, tour. Park. Yep, we did a, we did a two-part episode, one on Tripping on Legends, uh, which is uh, Safety Harbor, and then uh, we kind of did, before that, we did an episode of one of your shows, which is Paranormal Pets. Paranormal Pets, you're quite correct, yeah. So if you haven't listened to those two episodes and you wanna hear two people totally geeking out on folklore and like, you know, kind of uh, uh, talking about these things, uh, you know, getting less spooky and more into the, the meaning of things, like definitely listen to those two episodes in that interview. So um, tell us about Comfort Station. Oh, this is a great little building. So the Comfort Station is a very early construct for downtown St. Pete. So if you're not aware, um, St. Pete, Okay, I'm not quite sure what part of town you're from, but I'm going to say that St. Pete is like the most awesome place ever. Um, it has a great history, and it 
uh, it was kind of a fishing village in the 1880s. Uh, it, it was settled. They brought a railroad down. They hit some piers, and it began to grow. And uh, from 1905 to 1915, there's a definite building boom. And then there's a, a huge boom that hits in the 1920s. And that is actually where uh, Comfort Station Number 1 comes in. Uh, it was built in 1927. It's kind of this interesting octagonal red brick building that was commissioned by the city. So it's a public restroom. Um, and it's in a really unusual place because um, it kind of sits, and I know this sounds really odd, but uh, the, the water of the bay is on two sides of this building. so. You know, if you, you really uh, didn't have to go before you go into the restroom, just hearing all that water will probably make you have to. Right, right. But um, it's a great, great building. And, of course, um, for many years, it's been uh, reputed to be haunted. So um, I find that rather interesting. There's actually two legends uh, with this building. One is the haunting, and the other is the one that I always love. So we'll, we'll bust this one first because... Um, it's the history part, and then we can go into the supernatural stuff. But um, the story is that the person who built St. Mary's Church was also commissioned to build this bathroom, and that is true. Uh, the legend part of it is that St. Mary's uh, Catholic Church did not pay the architect uh, what he thought he was worth and in a timely manner. So he then constructed the bathroom to be in the same shape of St. Mary's out of kind of like this revenge plot. Well, that's actually not true. Uh, the bathroom was actually built first, and it's a reversal of that idea. He actually built the bathroom in the octagonal pattern because that's what he had planned to build for St. Mary's, and he wanted to work out some of the architectural details. So it was his so, trial uh, work. Yes. <laughs> I never thought about that with the bathroom, but that should tell you just well, how awesome this bathroom is. Because I'm, as I'm wondering, <coughs> Excuse me, maybe you can hit on this in Pinellas or other parts of um, Florida that were uh, booming at that time. Like, why such a fancy bathroom? Well, St. Pete was, um, it was definitely coming up in the world. We're in the 1920s. And you know, St. Pete, I mean, a lot of people don't realize, like, for example, in 1915, they built the first open air post office for something like nearly a million dollars. Wow. Um, there's a building boom that happens right around uh, Mirror Lake, which is the kind of the heart of downtown, at least the old heart. Uh, that's where their water reservoir was, and that's where they, you know, within that uh, two block area, you start getting churches and uh, St. Pete High School, the YMCA, and it's, it's kind of this building up, and it's got this beautiful kind of southern um, Midwestern feel to it. Um, the other thing is that this area was kind of following in some of the building boom patterns of retrofitting some of the architecture. So you'll see what's known as uh, Romanesque Revival and Neo-Gothic or Gothic Revival style architecture over here. Um, so it, it actually became part of the buildings. And of course, there's octagonal um, it was kind of a, an offshoot of the dome structure. So they're, they're kind of playing with some really Interesting stuff. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And it's, oh, one other quickie thing too yeah. is that it's a tourist destination. Tampa is industrial. Uh, it was industrial to begin with at its core. Uh, St. Pete was always designed to be tourist. So I guess if you want to bring people in, particularly that wealthy winter crowd, uh, you got to make sure your buildings look good. Exactly. Even the potties. <laughs> you could say bathrooms or something else. We, we, we have a. Uh... It's an NC-17. Uh, we don't swear on the show anymore, but still. Um, I, I was wondering because, uh, and this is maybe a good segue into the paranormal part of it. One building, and I think it's it's actually in my very first book, uh, Ghost, Ghostly Adventures, is the Vinoy, right? Yeah. Uh, and the same, yeah. guy, the same guy designed the Vinoy that designed the church and the bathroom. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah, they, they really kind of got into this one, yeah. <laughs> and, and I remember, I mean, keep in mind, this is 2003 or four that I'm doing the research mm -hmm. for this because especially being from Boston, it was a big deal that the stories would come out every year about the haunted Vinoy whenever they played, the, at that time, the Devil Rays, right? And so the newspapers right. uh -huh. would publish these. So there are tons of documented stories of baseball players talking about the hauntings there. And one of the yeah. things that I had uncovered 
uncovered back in the day, right? Like urban legend, but still <laughs> was that uh, kind of uh, in the in the in the realm of uh, Ghostbusters that the Vinoy had specifically been designed to conduct paranormal activity, that it was supposed to be the supernatural antenna. Which is interesting because you also see that over in Sarasota with the Ringling Mansion, that it has a lot of the kind of underground symbols mm -hmm. um, and connections, so sure. Any rumors like that on either the bathroom or uh, St. Mary's Church? Any of that stuff linger there? The church, I would say no, because I mean, it's a Catholic church, <laughs> so they're, they're kind of frowning on things like that. Right, right. The bathroom, I really, uh, I have not found anything that says it was really designed as, as anything other than an architectural, you know, attempt, that they were experimenting with ideologies, although uh, the octagonal shape, you know, the, the eight sides, um, you know, you kind of double the number four, it's seven plus one, you know, you start moving into some of the numerology, but... I haven't done a lot of that with this bathroom in particular. Um, it wouldn't surprise me necessarily, but um, nothing that I found uh, kind of right. gets this guy going into the... <laughs> and, uh, you really don't want the paranormal in the bathroom, but uh, nonetheless, you get it here. You get it, to, <laughs> so, it right. You get it You know, you get it more often uh, than it's not. And and it's what I, before we into the ghost yeah. part of it, I just want to say that... Um, you know, my journey went from uh, um, uh, the Hanoka to to all these ghostly legends in the bathroom. To then I'm like, oh, is there anything in Florida? And then I found Comfort Station. And before I knew it, I'm looking at your page, and you're literally talking about in reverse order on the page, which I've actually posted in the notes. The way I'm talking, you talked about the comfort to the to the Korean to the Japanese, and I'm like, man, why does that bitch gotta get there before me all the time? It's in part, believe it or not, because of paranormal pets. And I did like a year's worth of episodes on yokai. Yikes. And when I was a, a full professor, um, I actually utilized yokai as an element of encapsulating um, cultural fears and cultural beliefs into these little critters. Right. Um, I mean, it was it was fun to do with the students. Um, but I would, you know, because usually I taught in the fall, and so, you know, I would always have something around Halloween. So, of course, you know, I'm not, not missing that opportunity. And it's so funny because uh, the bathroom yokai, I mean, oh, the yokai, the, the ones that are still my favorite are the, and they're not listed here, but they're the ones that, uh, there's one that will lick, uh, like, mold off your ceiling, and there's one that will lick the dirty ring out of your bathtub, and they're just so harmless, but it's just disgusting. That would, you really don't want those in your house. I've, I've got that. <laughs> See, wait a minute, I've got it, I've got it. It is the Anakanami. Yes. Which is yep. which is called which is translated into the filth liquor. Which uh, you just go, oh god! But it's what a great lesson right there because if you don't keep your house clean, ladies right. and, and today's world, gentlemen, of course, uh, you know you're going to get these critters, you know, in your house, and you really, you know, yeah. I mean, they're helpful, but you know, it's like having a cockroach. <laughs> and it's and you know, I'd be like, no, no, no. And so I, I did do. some. I'm good. I did some research on those, and one of the things that I found out was that it the the orientation of it, or the the legends and the folklore about that uh, about the filth liquor. I'm just going to call it the filth liquor because that sounds better anyway. Yeah, I'm not the part of the Japanese. Right. <laughs> Is this idea that it it started from? Um, you know, it's almost the reverse order of what folklore normally is. It started from broken down estates. And mm -hmm. and the rich, right? And then it became yeah. so. Look, this could even happen to the rich. Imagine if you don't clean your bathroom. Sure. So sure. It, it's it's this yeah, interesting little twist. Very, it's, it's, and it's just great. I mean, really, to see kind of how the yokai uh, did spread into folklore and into legend. Um, and you know, oddly enough, one of the pop culture spots that touched on it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, of all things. Right. Where, you know, they go back in time and they see Master Yoshi's wife and she thinks that they are yokai from the water and she keeps trying to feed them cucumbers. <laughs> you know, and it's, yeah, and it's like, oh my, you know, and they're like, no, we're not. We're not. Would you please stop that? You know, but it was just, um, the, I think one of my other favorite yokai, though, is the, uh, the idea that something that hits 100 years old 
gets its own spirit. And I'm just like, we, in St. Pete, we have all of these buildings that are about ready to turn 100 over the next decade, you know? Right. And I'm, just, I'm really curious to see what happens. I, I always thought that was a really neat idea, in particular because it venerates um, something that survived. I mean, I'm in a 1940s house, but, um, you know, folks are like, well, I don't know why you bought an older house. I'm like, because the thing has withstood how many things. You know? Right, exactly. If it withstand everything before me, then it might survive my living here. So... You know, it's just, uh, they are a fun, fun topic. So, and there's, where else do you find something that comes into the bathroom? So they, you know, there's some really creepy, creepy, you know, deadly legends uh, associated with yokais and, and restrooms and things that you just, uh, I personally, I, I really would rather not encounter pretty much any of them. <laughs> I, mean, I think I'm good having my bathroom to me. And it's interesting, you know? I, I think that, you know, American culture, can um can take a step back from that because you know we are being a judeo-christian society we are so much more of you know our demons come from the psyche as opposed to someplace yeah. specific so we can kind of poo poo yeah. those things and almost be playful i'm thinking of is it ghoulies where the where the bathroom yeah. where it's coming out of the toilet and we can laugh at that and we don't really believe it and then we see a horror movie like um, like Dark Waters, and it kind of rushes it back because it makes it more, you know, we don't have the demons of the bathroom. We've got ghosts of the bathroom, you know? And yeah. so that's our way yep. to kind of express that. So tell us tell us about the ghost stories having to do with Comfort Station. Well, Comfort Station um, apparently has its resident ghost. It, uh, she is. It's a she. Uh, and of course, she's on the ladies in the ladies' room. I'm like, oh, naturally. But there have been multiple reports over the years that um, folks will, ladies will go in to use the restroom. Uh, one of my favorites is that there was a tourist and her sister who had gone to use the, the restroom, and the sister, uh, one sister went in, and one sister waited outside. You know, a public restroom. Okay. So the one sister who's actually in the stall all of a sudden heard somebody come into the stall next to her and she saw kind of a pair of like black patent shoes. And yeah, this is what always amazes me. I, and I may be strange. I don't know. I'm, well, I am strange. But I've never really struck up a conversation <laughs> one, from one no. stall to another with anybody I know, much less anybody I right. don't know. But apparently this conversation ensues. And which, you know, the woman basically says, you know, hello, and, you know, she says hi, and, you know, the woman introduces herself. Um, and uh, ultimately, let me think that, I always want to call her Agnes. Yep. What is Agnes? Okay, it is good. Agnes, yeah. <laughs> I kept calling her Myrtle at one point. I'm like, no, it's not right, it's Agnes. But, um, and the woman who is, you know, I guess has this little conversation, how long have you lived in St. Pete? Well, a very long time. Well, she finally gets out of the, of the restroom and discovers that she's completely alone. There's nobody in the stall next to her. Nobody has come and gone. Her sister's outside. Uh, you know, and it's, it's one of those things where she's, you know, what happened? And, of course, some of the other rumors are um, uh, you'll look in the mirror and you'll see somebody standing next to you, and when you turn around, you're alone, which is a good, good one for the paranormal. Um, one of my other favorite ones is that uh, one person opened a stall and saw a head bobbing in the toilet seat, you know, in the toilet. Uh, and then looked away and looked back, and there was nothing there. But I'm thinking, really, Agnes? No. Right. Uh, but, at, at that you know, point, I'm not going to the bathroom there. I I can find it. I can hold it. <laughs> you know, like, it's just kind of one of those things. Um, I have been in the restroom a few times. Now, I have to be a little bit careful because, you know, if I go in with equipment into the ladies' public bathroom, it does look a little awkward. But, yeah, I think I remember an episode uh, you know, of Law & Order SVU about that, so... <laughs> oh, no! Yeah, okay. But, you know, I try to make sure nobody's around, and I go, and it's like, you know, it's like a, a recorder, EMF meter, and a video. I think it's basically all I've tried in there, because you can kind of smuggle that in your purse pretty easily. Right. And, um... I have had absolutely no luck, you know, and she hasn't shown up for me at all. Um, you know, the, the part of the legend is that you hear mysterious flushes in the stalls around you. Well, the men's room is right up against the women's room, right. but they kind of seem to share a wall. And let me tell you, man, gentlemen, every time you flush, it is very loud in the ladies' room. I mean, it's, it's a pretty obvious sound. So I'm thinking, well, that part, you know, is probably just nature. Uh, or not nature, <laughs> it's just how well it is nature, but it is natural. I mean, there's nothing supernatural there. But, um, 
you know, I, I try to do the recordings. I try to, you know, do the mirror. I walk through the stalls, you know, nothing. So a little disappointed, but, um, you know, I, I will just have to keep drinking water and using that restroom to see if anything happens. Have you uh, have you brought the pugs in? So for those of you guys who don't know, um, uh, Doctor Stark uh, oftentimes will bring her paranormally trained dogs to different locations. So have you ever brought the uh, have you ever brought the pugs? And I know they've got you Greek what? names, I but I always not. forget them. So what are the names of the pugs? Oh, it's, well, uh, the two that I have right now are Achilles, uh, who is semi-retired. Uh, he is 14 and a half, so he's, he's getting kind of up there. Right. Um, and the other one is Patroclus, who is sense. his successor. Um, and I actually had the two of them together at one point in the studio. I have an art studio downtown, and it, it actually has its own friendly ghost, so I'm really cool with that. Um, and I was really shocked at that these two work together so well. So um, downtown, I, I now have a... Uh, one of those little doggy strollers, um, and you know, you I don't take Achilles. I mean, he would he would do well being pushed in a stroller, and I think it's Patroclus. I don't think anybody would stop me from going in. I think uh, I think people I would think that you were. It. I think you would be less creepy looking with two dogs and even one in a stroller <laughs> than with an <laughs> EMF <laughs> meter. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or a camera. You know. Right. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I'm just, I'm just taking pictures of the historic inside of this restroom. I swear. But so that's a good idea. I've not done it. I'd love to try that. Two of the two legend kind of questions with this. The first one would be, uh, I noticed something on your page, and then I don't know, obviously, whether someone's copying you uh, or whether they've kind oh. of tracked their own story about it. But at some point, uh, Agnes becomes Myrtle. Uh, and so, okay. do we do we think that has to do with Moaning Myrtle more than an actual second ghost? It's either that, or because the urban legend, you know, I think people kind of remember it as kind of a kind of a creepy older name, uh, an, an offbeat name. Right. So I think I think it just may, may be a misremembering. Um, I believe I have actually heard both names attributed to this ghost, but I right. think it's just one. Uh, all of the behaviors are the same, but I, you know, next time we go in, we'll just have to say, you know, uh, Agnes, <laughs> please let Myrtle? us know if you're here, and then we can try Myrtle. Maybe there's sisters there. That'd be weird. But so you know, the the, no, the no. moaning Myrtle is the reference to the the ghost in Harry Potter who uh, who wouldn't Which make an appearance really cool. until the late '90s. Who's yeah, is a very cool ghost and has, uh, if I'm not mistaken, she's killed by Voldemort in the early days, right? Because um, okay. she's killed by Tom yeah. Riddle, if I'm not mistaken. Not Harry Potter war. I saw the movie. <laughs> All right, then I'm going to either offend, but you know what? I don't care. I, she stole from me, so I can I can mess up her stuff too. Um, so I believe the story is that she's killed by Tom Riddle when he's still Tom Riddle before he's Voldemort. I believe is is the story, okay. and that's why she's stuck there, um, supposed to be guarding the the bathroom because she was some girls were making fun of her. She went into the bathroom. Tom Riddle went to comfort her, and then ended up killing her, realizing that, like, no one would really care if she died anyway. If I'm not mistaken, that's the story, but... Um, and what is so cool is that that is a playoff of another urban legend. And what would um, that be? Let me, let's see. Okay, give me one second, because I just want to make sure I get this. Um, okay, here it is, actually. Uh, they say one day... <laughs> Boy, that's terrifying. Uh, they say one day a geeky boy went into the boys' bathroom alone. Uh, while he was washing his hands, one of the school boys walked in and decided to play a little game. He and his bud snuck up behind the boy and pushed him into the mirror. The boy hit the mirror, smashed it, and a piece of glass went into his neck, killing him. Uh, the boys could do nothing but watch him bleed out, and so uh, the blood mixing with the running water is kind of that, that right. great imagery there. Uh, panicked, they tore up the floorboards under the sink and shoved the body inside. The school became abandoned, but you can still tour it. But if you go into the boys' bathroom and stand at the sink and look in the mirror, you'll see the kid behind you. He'll take his revenge, and he'll push you into the mirror, and you'll die. Uh, then he drags you with him down into the floorboards, and you'll never be seen again. <laughs> Which I think is a great one. And that is that, a, um, is that in a particular location, or is it... Um, or is that one from this just a, a general folklore, general? This is a, it's a Tennessee urban legend. Okay. And I did put the link up on the page, uh, Urban Legends Online. It's called Bully Butcher Boy in the Bathroom. <laughs> I'm like, okay. well, that's good alliteration. 
And that, um, so yeah, I mean, that story exists. And that has actually mirrored, no pun intended, it's mirrored in the, uh, the Hanako uh, urban legend that I'm going to get into a little bit later about both the male the and girl. female side both have a variation um, that have to do with bullying. And, and obviously, um, mm -hmm. as that's going to become more and more popular going to the end of the 20th century and then into the 21st century, where bullying is so much more prevalent on people's brains, this idea of the tortured soul who gets bullied, who comes back to get revenge, is going to gain more popularity and kind of seep into other cultures. So it's, it's interesting that, you know, it seems to be that uh, if that, depending on where that story comes from, whether that's borrowed as part of the Japanese legend or whether that is kind of like the Japanese legend influenced the Tennessee one. Well, well, and again, there's both uh, Japanese and Korea, so you're you're correct. Um, that is actually, that is a good question, but it does seem like most of these dudes are 20th century, and they mm -hmm. do deal with bullying of some sort. So um, the undercurrent is certainly there. Right. Of course, you know, what I find really interesting, because if you think about it, people, for example, as a woman, if you are being harassed by somebody, uh, you know, where do you go? You run into the ladies' room. I mean, you see it in right. the movies, you know, and, and this whole idea that this if a woman goes into a ladies' room, it's like there's a magical barrier that men can't follow The warm force right? field goes up, right? Right, you know, it's exactly what happens. But um, it's kind of, it's a weird place because it's a place of safety, uh, mm -hmm. gender safety in some ways. But at the same time, if you think about what happens in a bathroom, you've got nakedness. Uh, so exposure. Um, there's all sorts of psychological studies about, for example, people who cannot, um, who can't poop in a in a toilet that's not at home. And you know, there's plenty of folks that feel uncomfortable using a, a foreign restroom, right? Um, because there's a psychological element of uh, being exposed. I mean, you're you know, you're in a fairly weak position, if you will. Uh, and you're kind of stuck until, you know, unless you're going to make a mess, until things are gone. Um, you know, it can be a place of sickness. Um, and, of course, the, the other element is, you know, you have water coming in and out. You've got ghost stories with faucets, so faucets and running water. Um, and the whole idea of kind of this meeting place between worlds. So you have clean water, it goes out as dirty water, it comes back as clean. Um, and it's also that clean. it's also that paradox of you doing the most in public restrooms, you doing the most intimate, yeah. shameful thing that you can possibly imagine in public next to someone who might be doing the same exact thing. So you're both uh, uh -huh. ashamed and yet oddly curious, and yet like you don't want to be involved in their intimacy. And yet you're forced to, and you, and there's an also, I, I don't want to get too graphic or anything like that, but there's also an unpredictability to uh, that intimacy that you can hide when you're alone, but when you are out there, and, and so you go from the fear of having to learn to go to the bathroom and all the things I talked about in the first part of the show having to do with, you know, the, the noisiness of it and the intimidation of learning how to go potty. And then the next thing right. you know, all of a sudden yeah. you're in a school where you have to do it in front of people. And by the way, like probably the second place after the bus where violent acts occur against you, right? Like where there is bullying, yeah. where there is, you know, people don't say, uh, you know, I was scared of uh, what would happen to me in algebra. They say, I was scared I was going to get my head dunked in the toilet, you know, or I didn't go right. to the bathroom because yeah. that's where the bad kids are always hanging out smoking and they're going to beat me up if I go yeah. in there. So it is this constant through our childhood and adolescence, this constant place of terror, and then all of a sudden it's like, all right, now you're an adult, don't be scared of it anymore, and that's not gonna happen. Right, well, and you've got a really good point there because, you know, bathrooms in and of themselves are part of the structure, but they're not, a, and they're a main part of the structure, but they're also intensely private. Um, you know, so they're kind of this weird mix. I mean, you don't hold a class in a restroom, um, right. But at the same time, you know, all you have to do is say, I have to go to the restroom and everybody knows what you're doing, right? right? I mean, there's just nobody has to ask questions, so. Well, I know what happens. Um, if you're one of my students, you're going in there with a vape, but I can understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in, in that sense, I mean, uh, we're right. all familiar with what a restroom does. You're quite correct, particularly in the West, because, uh, and it's actually kind of Freudian too, what you're describing, the, the notion of, uh, 
the anal retentiveness and then the sexual, you know, the genitalia fascination. Uh, you know, and, and again, you know, we're completely exposed. Um, and yeah, we, we are taught, uh, you know, to be ashamed. The Romans had public restrooms and you literally, and I always thought this was great, you would sit cheek to cheek with your neighbor over a hole, yeah. you know, so everybody had their hole, but they're in a row. And you would sit cheek, cheek to cheek, leg to leg with your neighbor and do your business. Uh, there wasn't a partition, you know, that comes up. There seems to really be something of, you know, post-Christianity where um, there's kind of this degradation of the physical. You know, the physical is bad and right. it should be hidden. Um, so you, that's, a, that's a really cool, really cool point right there. You know, and once again, yeah. being, being a high school teacher, uh, especially of, of freshmen, you know what I'm saying? So still in that kind of early teenage years, I'm oh, looking. Yeah. I'm looking at my list of uh, of places that uh, haunted bathrooms where I've been, and I'm noticing mm -hmm. that um, almost all of them are females. Uh, literally, in both the legends and the actual ones where I've been to, the only one who's not um, is Candyman. Um, in terms of okay. the ones that I'm yeah. talking about. And there is something inherently, because I don't know, I've had this exchange more times than I've ever wanted to or ever thought I would, which is, Mr. Balzano, can I go to the bathroom? No. And then she raised an eyebrow at me and I go, yes. You know, be, and, and everyone in the class catches it, even though we think it's subtle. And it is this idea that menstruation is also, once again, all the stuff we've already mm -hmm. talked about symbol-wise, Menstruation is this thing that, for a freshman, it's probably worse in, in junior high and high and, and middle school. But this idea that everyone knows you're going out there because you have your period, um, and everyone knows you're being able to leave because you have your period. You know what I'm saying? And and there's what I see is um, girls go over the top, and they say, "Mr. Bolzano, you have to let me leave because I'm bleeding right now." Like. It's almost as if they, they oh. overdo it because they're so embarrassed mm -hmm. by it that they have to just embrace it loudly because everyone knows why she's leaving. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a really, in the book that I was talking about, the, the haunted experience, there's a throwaway line about it. I wasn't sure whether you had any kind of insights into the connection between menstruation and this whole fear of the, of the bathroom. Because that was well, like... That was kind of interesting. <laughs> Because women, you know, religiously speaking, women literally bring you into the conditioned world. So, um, you know, through birth, uh, you know, in the womb, you are in a world of, of kind of oneness with your mother. Uh, but through birth, you kind of enter into the world of separation. Mm -hmm. um, and so you enter the world of duality and not only of life, but also of death. So women are not only the life bringers, but we are as an aside, the bringers of death. And of course, menstruation, um, you know, in the ancient world, it really wasn't that bad of a thing. Although women, you know, it, it is the most powerful element of, of womanness because a woman can bleed and not die. You know, if a man bled for seven days uh, or three days or four days, you know, whatever it happens to be, but it would be lethal. Um, you know, even to the extent that you find um, some tribes in Australia, for example, doing what are known as subpenile incisions in order to let out the bad blood, to, to menstruate like women do. It becomes symbolic of releasing kind of the impurities of the body. And of course, with menstruation, it's the opposite of fertility. It is the uh, emptying of the womb that is not impregnated. So it in itself is kind of a death element. Um, right. It's the lifeblood that is discarded. So I, I think you've got a really interesting point there. And of course, women are associated with the soul as well. I mean, you had the psyche, um, the element of the soul itself is feminine. And even in Christianity, God is married to the soul. It becomes a kind of a symbol. Uh, and the soul is feminine. Um, so it's, you know, it's seen as almost a marriage uh, and a partnership that way. So, um, and in bathrooms, that's pretty, you know, it, I don't want to say it's sexual, it's not that way, but it's certainly gender oriented. So right. again, you are definitely in contact with those elements and, um, you know, it's, even in privacy, you know, you are still, uh, you know, manipulating genitalia, life and death.
you know, so yeah, kind of there was there, there yeah. was there was just so many um, uh, symbols of it that had to do with red and with blood, and so it's just I know we might have lost half of the audience who was like, dude, this is not the discussion I wanted to have tonight. <laughs> But, I mean, it is an element of it that does seem to kind of come through. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. And it is, it, it is, it's a very interesting one. Um, and again, uh, even our discomfort with uh, discussions on menstruation, I mean, that really does tell you a lot about the West. Um, I mean, it's a, the desexualization of the culture in many ways and the embarrassment of menstruation which in the ancient world would not have been seen as an embarrassment. There were tribes in Africa where a woman's first menstruation, she was paraded through the village. Uh, she would, they would collect her menstrual blood and put it on her shoulders. She would wear it like a badge. Um, and she would, you know, dress, uh, you know, in a, in a special outfit and she would be treated to a dinner because she now had that power of life and death, of particularly a life bringer. So, it's, so it's, it was celebrated, but here in the West, uh, and, and you see it with Judaism as well. I mean, remember Rebecca, uh, you know, they're trying to leave and, uh, you know, they smuggle some things out and the guards come to search the belongings of these fleeing, uh, technically, uh, Israelites. And, uh, you know, Rebecca sits on a saddle full of, you know, of these stolen goods and, or with these stolen goods and says, uh, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on my menses, I can't get up, and the guards are like, ew, <laughs> they leave, right? That's in the Bible. So it, it's that notion of uncleanliness as well. Um, Although we do we have, really see that in the West. we do have now the tradition um, about uh, period parties, first period parties, and, and things like that, which yeah. are kind of making this weird, I'm not going to say weird, it's not for me to say weird, uh, but definitely like an upswing of that kind of uh, I think. And, and I thought it was just a parody, but it is something that is popular and something that's been going on. Yeah, it's kind of an embracing of that feminism. And of course, um, for men, since we're not probably going to be doing any sub penile incisions, uh, you know, they get the first shave. You know, I've, I've heard of folks that, you know, they celebrate uh, the the... Uh, growth of the beard as a sign, the testosterone of manliness, and so the first shave, you know, so it's it's definitely um, definitely a change. And I've got but, my uh, I've got my quarantine beard going on, so I must be really manly right now. No, I I am now part of that uh, do-it-yourself haircutting club. <laughs> and I, I don't know how we did. But. I am I am going to show. I I saw your hair. I'm going to show for those of you guys who. I've actually shaved my head. This is the first time in, in – uh, I used to have a shaved head for about 10 years, and then my sisters paid me to grow my hair out when I first got my divorce because they thought I would be more dreamy that way. So that is the first time in a very long time that I've shaved my head, but it was like, dude, it's not worth it, so I'm just going to shave it. So that's what, one of the reasons why I'm wearing my hat tonight. Yeah, and in fact, uh, I have been advised by friends, uh, you know, if it looks that bad, just wear a hat. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky at work. They well, don't like my blue hair, so I got to wear a wig. <laughs> I was going to say, and you've got some really funky hats from what I remember, like the one you wore at uh, uh, at Spooky Empire last year. So you've got no problem in the hat department. Yeah, it, it's all good. But And in fact, one of these days, uh, I think it would be interesting to do an urban legend based on hair. Uh, because hair, and your sisters are right, hair is a symbol of... Uh, very naughty pug of testosterone the right there. and masculinity, as well as feminine sexuality. So if you really want some fun, uh, I mean, look at the religious folks who shave their heads, right? right. Um, and they yeah, do that to get rid of their sexuality. That's a whole different, that's not Western stuff, so right. we'll, we'll just save that for another day. We'll save that because now you're starting to make me think there's something not abnormal about the ridiculous hairy back I have, and I'm not going to go, I'm not even getting into that tonight, Dr. Scott. Um, oh, just be proud. It's testosterone. It's a sign of your manhood. A lot of testosterone that. going on there. Um, so there I, go. I had suggested that when, when this is over and we're allowed to leave the house again, um, that <laughs> that we go, uh, that we go to Comfort Station and we do simultaneous yeah. uh, explorations of uh, of the of the the male side and the female side and kind of do That's things. Great. And then one of the things I had suggested, and I wasn't sure how you felt about this, was that we kind of bring another paranormal or another folklore element into it, and that we do simultaneous uh, Bloody Marys while we're there. <laughs> I, I'm going to turn 
we'll get to that one, but uh, you know, it'd, it'd be interesting um, because, of course, you know, on the on the page as well, we talk about the Bloody Mary legend with right. uh, the mirror, the soul, and and having your face torn off. I yeah, you know, I am attached to it, but uh, it would be rather interesting. So, uh, and of course, we could do a paranormal pet episode if I bring the frogs. <laughs> Yeah, we'll right. see what they what they do. We'll do a whole little thing of everything, and, and you know what I'm saying, like a little That's bit right. of folklore, a little bit of a little bit of science, a little bit of everything. So, sound yeah, good? And puns. We'll just check off all the boxes. It's exactly. good to me, sure. Well, I mean that because it is really one of those places where it's like, well, wait a minute, it's got all this paranormal stuff we talked about at the beginning, all this paranormal <laughs> stuff, paranormal elements to it in terms of the water and it could go cross water, or can't yeah. they cross water? They generated by it. It's got the, you know, all the psychological elements of being scared because of the, all the things we've talked about. And then it's got, like, the folklore aspect. So it really does click all the boxes. So we might as well go in there and, you know, see if we can raise Nomo or, or Momo or whoever her name is, too, right? Let's do the whole thing. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. As long as we don't, you know, get, uh, what is it, a couple of stories talk about you're offered a red paper or a blue paper. Uh, in the you know by this ghost, if you take the red, it's going to rip your skin off, and if you uh, if you accept the blue paper, she suffocates you to death. Right, but, right. You know, I guess we'll deal with that when it comes up. I was going to say the whole red pill, blue thing, blue pill is supposed to be like one of them is a good choice, but for you know for for that, and that's actually I've heard conflicting things on that. This is once again into the Hanako one, but that it's only the male the male one is the one that offers the choice, and the female one doesn't offer the yeah. choice. Seven. And then I've heard it that the okay. female does also offer the choice. So it's really one of those things where, you know, it's it's a it's a smorgasbord. Like, what do you like in your salad bar? We're gonna. This legend seems to offer it all. So. And the east and the east uh, gender bending happens. I mean, the, it is not uncommon to have deities who transform from one gender to the other to to fulfill different roles. So, uh, makes sense to me. <laughs> and even and even the plan ready. And even the Hanako. Um, has a a kind of um you know there there is that uh, ambiguity because she's got the short bobbed hair like the male but she's supposed to be female and she's wearing the dress so there is that androgyny thing going on with the ghost on either side of it so you're right you're right and of course uh you know she's uh it's supposed to be a tween like one of the puberty. yeah oh, no, i'm so sorry i don't this puzzle of mine is terrible. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, the awakening sexuality where you kind of come out of that ambiguous state. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. Uh, would you like a puzzle? I'm going to make you a yet. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to uh, let you go way. anyway. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank and you very much for coming on. Thing. I, yeah, as, as soon as everything gets lifted, that's where I'm, that's the first thing I'm doing is going to the bathroom with you, so. Thing I've heard so far. So I, I know, forget about all those. We'll drink together and stuff like that. It's like we're going to the bathroom. So, Dr. Brandy Stark, no, thank no, you no, very no. much for coming on the show tonight. No problem. You guys have a great night and enjoy your legends. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.